Hi, Chris. I'm going to make you um, host so you can share your screen and get set up. Um, I don't see the mic, um, uh, microphone, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, okay, no, that's fine. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey, good to see you, Martaza. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good to see you, man. Me too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm okay. All right, great. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for the invite to do this. Yeah, sure. Thank you for accepting and joining us. Yeah, of um, course. That's really great that having you from New Zealand. So I, I think it's like 10 a.m. there, right? Or Yeah, it's, it's fine. All right. <laughs> All right. No problem. Um, and I'm trying to like... I have the sunlight that's bouncing off part of my windowsill, so I'm trying to put towels so I'm, so that it's like uh, so that it's not so bright. Hold on. Right. All right. Because I usually this 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 desk is in the window because yeah. just, I did that because we had a lockdown and I just wanted a nice view. But it I also I, I have to wear sunglasses for all my morning meetings, which I could do yeah. during this, but I don't know if that would be scientifically professional. I see. How about Corona uh, wires and news? I heard nobody has Corona. Is that right? Or um, we have. Yeah, there's a little bit here. Like they're, um, we're trying to, we're trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible before I guess there's there are like a hundred cases in the community per day. Um, there's five five million people, so um, I mean it's a hundred is worse than zero, but it's uh, yeah, it's okay. I mean, there's yeah. only two people have died in the late in this like ongoing outbreak um they were, i think they were both really old um and i think there's like yeah i think we're just sort of trying to like keep the get the vaccination rate up high enough that like there's enough space in hospitals all the time so that 
Yeah. And, and that people can get the care that they need. Um, oh, yeah. We're like, I think we're at 86% like single vaccinated right now. So wow, it's a high number. Yeah, it's okay. There's not that many people in New Zealand. So it's easy to like, there was, there was a day last Saturday where we got like 130,000 vaccinations done, which is like, uh, I guess we totally in total, we need 10 million for 5 million people. So that was like, right. yeah, that was like 1.3% of the entire goal, like on one day. So yeah, it's, yeah, this is okay. I mean, yeah. How is it there? Um, it's fine. Uh, since 2018, I moved uh, to Dallas and I'm still here. So yeah. It's good. I like it. So most of the time I teach, I don't do any research at the moment. Um, it's only, you know, teaching, but in general, it, it's fine. It's cool. Fine. Yeah, I was at Michigan State University in 2018 to 2019. So I, I know Dave Heinemann a little bit. Like I met him a few times. So I saw yeah. that he, yeah, he moved friend. here. Yeah, he's our yeah. dean now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So you moved to New Zealand in, in 2020, right? Yeah. Uh, well, actually in April of this year, I sort of like oh. got, I started working in 2020 from, the, I was in the UK um, yeah. at the University of Leeds in from 2019 till basically April this year. I see. Um, although I went home to California for a few months over last winter. That's what just, Great. Like, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, and then, uh, and then just came, I've been here since April. Right. That's great. It's, I'm very lucky. I, lucky is actually not a strong enough word, I don't think. <laughs> That's so. great. How is your, uh, like your family, are you from Tehran or where in Iran? Yeah, my dad from Tehran and my mom from another city in Tabriz. Uh, okay. But I grew up in Tabriz, northwest of Iran, next okay. to, you know, very close to the Turkey border. So yeah. Um, I've seen pictures of Tabriz in the area. It's spectacular. Yes. But how's, how's the COVID there? Uh, it's disaster. I mean, the rate of vaccination is low and the case okay. number is just improving, you know, every day. So it's going up. I mean, it, improving in terms of the number, it's going up, actually. It's yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's a very difficult time uh, over there. Here as well, I mean, Texas also um, still in the, you know, in, in campus, the number of the positive cases is declining. It's less than half percent. They are just doing, you know, tests every week and they are monitoring. The rate yeah. is like 0.2% every week. Okay. It's not that much. Uh, but in the city, it's still, you know, I hear that, you know, every week, like 900 people, um, dying and it still is high, I guess, this number for the, uh, for the area that I'm leaving. And no yeah. doubts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have like three minutes. So um, okay. we'll wait until four. Let's see.
So, Chris, normally we have like 45 minutes for the for the talk and uh, last 15 minutes for the question session. So um, that's the way that we run, and we will be here until until five. So, okay, the time it uh, it's enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, especially at the end of the day. All right, perfect. So I think I will start. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm really pleased to um, introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Chris Rawlings. Um, I met Chris actually uh, at Caltech when I was doing a postdoc there, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. And he accepted my invitation, and he's going to talk about the um, uh, seismic hazards. Uh, he will get into the details, but I will give you a little bit of information about his background. He did a bachelor degree um, in University of Southern California in 2011, and then moved to Caltech in 2017 for doing a PhD there with Jean-Philippe Avoc. And then since then, he did quite a few um, uh, different postdocs in different places in University of Alaska, Michigan State University, and then in University of Leeds in Great Britain. And last year he moved to New Zealand. And right now he's working as a scientist at GNS Science. So GNS Science is an Institute for Geological and Nuclear Sciences in New Zealand. And um, Chris is working as a geodetic modeler and uh, seismic hazard engineer. So um, by saying that, uh, Chris, thanks very much for accepting and state yours. Please uh, go you. ahead and uh time yours. thank you yeah all right so you can share you can see my screen right okay yes perfect okay so yeah thanks so much for the um the invite and the kind introduction Mortaza. um uh and thanks everybody for coming today um so yeah, today I'll be talking about some work that I have been doing um, in a couple different parts of the world to understand using geodesy and combining that with earthquake statistics and earthquake occurrence to, un to understand how the two influence one another um, and what they mean for seismic hazards. Um, and so we're going to start in uh, Turkey and the Caucasus and then um, end in Alaska. So the overarching question of my research and my work at, and for example, at GNS right now is to understand where and when or failing that, how often are earthquakes likely to strike? Um, if, we can, if we can get at this also how big they might be and maybe even what kind they might be, um, thrust or strike slip or um, that kind of thing. Um, and so there are a few different factors that go into this. Um, so you can kind of separate them loosely, although it's not a clean separation into time independent um, or things that are pretty steady through time and time dependent factors. So time independent factors, an example of that would be how are the Earth's plates sort of trying to move gradually about its surface? Um, and maybe more deeply, why are they trying to do so? So, you know, we can, we can use geodesy. These are GPS vectors, these black arrows um, showing, you know, the collision of India with Asia um, by the way, the arrows, the zero uh, velocity is Eurasia. So you see the spectacular collision of India with Asia here and the rotation of Anatolia to the westward, which we'll talk about uh, in a second, um, as well as the convergence of Arabia, and the building of Iran. Um, and so why, how are the Earth's plates sort of trying to do that? And, um, and you know, what are the forces driving that? And it's true that that does change over time and we're coming to an understanding of that, but that might be about as time that's stationary as you get. Um, a less time stationary, although maybe still sort of one is like where and how and why does that plate motion, that relative plate motion get hung up on different faults such as the North Anatolian fault here. And what does that mean for the stress state on those faults? And then what does that mean for earthquakes on those faults? And we'll explore that. And then an example of a time in, a time dependent uh, influence would be something like how is the, that stress state like you see on the North Anatolian fault? How does that change throughout the occurrence of earthquakes and the seismic cycle? Um, for example, from inter, inter seismic loading to post seismic relaxation and things like that. Um, how does it change when earthquakes interact with each other by stress transfer? And then also other shorter time scale phenomena that can 
modulate the stress state um, and earthquake occurrence. And that's what we'll, we'll get to in the second example in Alaska. Um, so the first case I'll be talking about is kind of on the time independent side of things. Um, and I'll, I'll be just an example of using geodesy and um, some earthquakes to, under, to understand where tectonic strain is building up in Anatolia and the Caucasus region and what does that imply for earthquakes and their likelihoods. And this is work I've been doing um, at the University of Leeds in collaboration with Comet, the Center for the Observation and Modeling of Tech, um, Earthquakes, Volcanoes and Tectonics, and with my advisor, Tim Wright, and some other plenty of people that helped out with this. So um, for those who are not familiar with the setting of Anatolia, um, basically, uh, as we saw in that GPS plot, Arabia is impinging on Eurasia from the south, um, and it's squeezing out Anatolia to the west. So Anatolia is escaping kind of like if you squeeze out like a, a, a seed from a watermelon with your thumb and Anatolia is the seed. And it's also being pulled into the Hellenic subduction zone. Um, so it's, it's moving and rotating to the southwest. And um, that motion is, a lot of that motion is accommodated on two major strike slip faults. The North Anatolian fault, which is a right lateral fault, uh, which means that if you stand on one side, the, right, the, the other side will move to the right. Um, both in earthquakes and over geologic time. And the East Anatolian Fault is a conjugate left lateral fault. So the other side moves to the left. Um, this is a shot of the same sort of GPS vectors, actually a very similar data set showing each of these is a, shows the motion, um, the, the direction and rate of motion over time of a GPS station, which is sitting out on the Earth's surface in Anatolia, sort of like a tripod, like a survey tripod, and it's just moving and we can image its motion at millimeters per year accuracy. Um, and so the, what do you see here? You see, so these are, um, the zero of the motion here is set to be zero up here in stable Eurasia, which is a big continent that's just sort of sitting there with a bunch of cratons, so it's pretty stable. So it's a good reference point. So what do you see? You see that Anatolia, as um, we were talking about, is rotating to the west and um, it's sort of extruding out into the southwest. The Greek subduction zone is out here, so it's also getting pulled into it. Um, and the other thing you see is that the vectors pick up basically from nothing relative to Eurasia to the entire Anatolia motion relative to Eurasia as you cross the North Anatolia and fault this line here. So that, and, and then the Anatolia, I mean, yes, with some variability, but it's sort of rotating almost wholesale relative to Eurasia um, outside of the North Anatolian fault once you cross it. So that means that most of the strain from the, rel from the, the relative motion between Anatolia and Eurasia is gonna be accommodated on the North Anatolian fault and in earthquakes on it. So this is, this is useful because we, we know, okay, the North Anatolian fault is gonna be the major source of earthquakes, maybe the major source of earthquake hazard. We can already tell that from this figure. But we can't, the, these stations are not close enough together to get an idea of what the, what the specific strain rate is on this fault. Um, you can see, for example, this is 222 kilometers, two degrees of latitude. So, you know, we only have stations 50 kilometers away from the fault here, um, at least with good velocities. We have a few that are very close to the fault, but it's sort of irregular. So in order to get a, and you know, the fault is only 15 kilometers uh, from top to bottom. And so it's signal, I mean, depending on how densely you want to look, it's signal is going to get blended out easily by the time you get 50 to 100 kilometers away, or at least like the subtleties of it. So in order to go to a higher resolution understanding of what's happening on the fault as far as where patches are being like held and locked and getting stuck, and so you might want to look for an earthquake there, or that might be a likely place for an earthquake, we need to go to higher resolution data. So that's where INSAR comes in. Um, so at the University of Leeds, I I've been part of the LIXAR project, which is taking satellite radar um, and, and, uh, and making products of it to understand how the Earth's surface is moving in each of these frames over, over time. So essentially, I probably should have put an intro slide about INSAR if, if anybody's unfamiliar with it, but basically each of these frames is the, um, the frame of a picture that, this, that a satellite called Sentinel-1 takes of the Earth's surface as it passes overhead. And then it passes again overhead in like 12 days later. 
and it takes another picture. And you can take the difference between those two pictures and, and, and see, oh, that's moved, that's moved. It's sort of, you could do the same thing if you took, you know, sort of like a, um, a time-lapse photography uh, or something where you take, I mean, it's sort of what movies are because a movie is actually just a bunch of really rapid pictures and you just, it turn, you turn it into motion by looking at a bunch of them in quick succession. That's what we're doing here just with um, understanding this. So we'll be looking at the motion rate of the Earth's surface from all these different pictures. So these are half of the ascending track. The, these are half of the frames uh, taken by Sentinel-1 and processed by our Lixar service. These are the frames in which the, Sen the Sentinel-1 satellite is flying off to the north-northwest. So it's flying off this way along this line. So from, for example, like the, uh, the Nile Delta towards the western part of the Black Sea, and it's looking off to the right. So the satellite looks off to the right of it, um, sort of like Zoolander, it can't turn left. Um, and it looks off to the right, which is basically east on this track. And um, it, uh, so you can think of it in terms of like, is stuff going further away or closer to the satellite in the in, in, um, in a slick direction? And we'll see that in a sec. So yeah, so uh, this is in, with the look direction being off to, the, off to the east. And so blue motion means westward motion, red motion means eastward motion. Um, and this looks a little messy. We're gonna make it into a model and I have some slides at the end showing the details of that, but we can use these frames and resolve what's happening from frame to frame and within each frame as far as um, you can see different processes and different things moving relative to one another. These are the descending track frames. So in these frames, the satellite is moving, is flying south, southwest, and it's looking off to the right again. So it's looking off basically to the west here. And so, um, what you see here is that, so you can start to see the motion across the North Anatolian fault even here, um, even though all these frames are set to zero within each frame, which is something that we need to correct for by an estimation process. Um, and so you can see that you go from blue to yellow across the North Anatolian fault. Actually, when you stack that up against a bunch of different frames, it gets really obvious. Um, I won't go into the details yet. Um, but uh, you can also see a little bit of gradient across the East Anatolian Fault here. And again, all these are set to zero within each one. So even the variations within each frame um, show that. And then um, we also want to use whatever GPS or GNSS data we have. So this is sort of like an updated version of that vector plot that I showed you a few slides ago. I just found all the GNSS data I can across the Western Al Alpine Himalayan Belt. Um, the, the arrows show the horizontals and the colored circles show the vertical motions at the state at the stations for which that's recorded or well constrained. Um, and so I did some refinement, um, just some quality control on this data set. So again, you can see the westward rotation of Anatolia, clock, counterclockwise rotation, and also the collision that forms the Caucasus mountains, including Elbrus, which is the highest mountain in this region. Um, so what we do is we take that INSAR data, all these velocities and all these different frames, we correct for the fact that it's set to zero in each frame uh, as the average, or it's averaged up to zero. So we de-average it by using these, these vectors and these GNSS velocities, do a bunch of stuff with a computational mess, uh, mesh that I, uh, it, it can be a mess, but it's a mesh it's supposed to be that I, can't, that I uh, won't go into in detail here. Basically what we're trying to resolve is the 3D surface motion of um, over time, the gradual motion, say, of Anatolia past Eurasia in, um, in three dimensions. So this is what we resolve when we plug that in, um, the GNSS and the INSAR. Uh, so blue is westward here. This is the eastward velocities, so the eastward component of motion. So you can see we resolve the uh, wholesale westward motion of Anatolia pretty nicely here, including the break across the East Anatolian Fault and across the North Anatolian Fault. Um, this is the northward motion. So we go from a little bit positive here to a little bit negative here, consistent with this rotation. And then you also have a slowdown across the Caucasus, which is what we expect. This is the vertical motion. Um, this is the messiest of the three, but this is actually not that messy compared to um, how it could be, uh, depending on inconsistencies and different uncertainties. Um, so you see basically that there isn't that much vertical motion in a lot of 
Anatolia because it's mostly just sort of gliding off to the horizontally to the southwest. There's a little bit of extension that causes some subsidence. Um, and there's also some localized, this is a hydrological basin, this bullet hole here, that's just anthropo that's just water extraction of groundwater. So that's non-tectonic. So anyway, what we want to do with these, what we want to get, we can make these images of motion and say, cool, it's like moving off. What we want to look at is strain, not motion. So that's the derivative of surface motion with respect to each dimension. And then also what that implies for earthquakes. This is what the strain map looks like when we just take the, when, when we get get it from those 3D uh, motion direction maps. Um, and so you can see this very clear strain signal across the North Anatolian fault, which is what we expect is the major player in strain accumulation and release and the relative motion. Um, among some artifacts, for example, this one, which is caused by that hydrological loading, and we should probably just set that to zero because we only care about tectonic stuff, um, at least in this case, we do see a little bit of a signal of East Anatolian fault as well as uh, Caucasus convergence up here. Um, this is a, uh, well, I'll show in a sec what that is. So this is, this is why we need to go to high resolution data. This slide shows what you would get if you use, it, instead of using the combination of all these vectors and all those INSAR like images over time, all those movies averaged up to velocities. If you just use these GNSS vectors, which are, have a much wider spacing and lo lower resolution, um, you get a very blurry picture that's not only blurry, but also actually wrong, at least if you think this is the, the correct reference. If, if you just throw in the same smoothing and same mesh and everything, you get a much lower strain rate on the North Anatolian fault. So you probably come away thinking your earthquake rate might be lower. You get nothing anywhere else except a little bit of some artifacts here um, and a little bit of a hint on the East Anatolian fault. So that shows the use of, of incorporating both GNSS and INSAR data. This is just a correlation. This is just, sorry, this is a plot of the strain rates versus the locations of earthquakes um, in the last 120 years. And so you can see it actually marks up, matches up pretty well, you know, and that's not a surprise because we've had a devastating earthquake sequence on the North Anatolian fault in the past hundred years, uh, which has killed many tens of thousands of people in total. Um, and this also lines up with East Anatolian fault earthquakes. Interestingly, this, these line up decently with some earthquakes in um, the Caucasus region, although not perfectly. Um, this one is the devastating Armenia earthquake of 1988. This is actually a signal of deformation from the uh, sarpol -e zahab earthquake on the Iran-Iraq border that happened in 2017. So that happened during the INSAR data collection and that's, we, we haven't removed that signal. Um, so that should be correlated. But um, the rest of these earthquakes happened before the INSAR data was collected. So that means that like strain is still accumulating in those regions. And if we, if we compare that actually just to the rate of earthquakes in the catalog, uh, the, see if I was flip back and forth between the strain rate and the rate of earthquakes, you can see that they're pretty well spatially correlated. Um, and uh, we get the, in the North Anatolian fault, a lot of stuff in Western Anatolia. Um, so these could be some artifacts here, but they also could be real. There have been a lot of earthquakes. So some of it could be real. Um, and these, this is actually, this is a different me metric showing. Um, so seismic moment is a measure of the size of an earthquake. It's what magnitude is based on. And this is the size, this is the moment release rate in each of these little boxes um, from summed earthquakes over the past 120 years. So this is basically the summed earthquake size per unit time. It's the rate of earthquake in each of these boxes, which is different from the rate of, of like how many earthquakes you have, which can be, which does not take into account how big those earthquakes were, this does. So this, this is like the rate of earthquakeness. And so you can see a, you know, a, um, a correlation also with the, uh, with, with the strain uh, here across the top and then as well as the sort of crossroads here in um, Eastern Anatolia leading into the Caucasus. So we can take this moment idea further. What we can do is start to use the strain rates instead of just spatially comparing them, we can use the strain rates to, to figure out um, how much moment is building up and whether the earthquakes that we've seen in the last 120 years, how much of it they've helped release. And then, you know, if there's a lot left, how much, 
how big might an earthquake get that has to, to come along once every so often. So this shows the moment buildup rates and the, the earthquakes that have happened in Anatolia. Again, we've had this devastating earthquake sequence propagating westward on the North Anatolian Fault in the past 100 years, uh, starting with a 7.8 earthquake in 1939 in a city called Erzincan. Um, and so if we just look at the North Anatolian Fault, that's all, that's the only part I'll show today, but this is just, uh, cut out in the north, uh, within 60 kilometers of the North Anatolian Fault, so this sort of zone here, uh, and we're just gonna compare strain and earthquakes. Um, so the total moment buildup rate in this blob is uh, this, this number, which um, 1.67 times 10 to the 19th Pascal seconds. Um, and the total moment release rate in all of these earthquakes combined over 112 years um, is um, about two times 10 to the 21 Pascal seconds. Um, and so if you say, okay, this is, let's say this is a typical set of earthquakes because we've had a near complete rupture of the entire North Anatolian fault. So let's just pile all these earthquakes together and say, all right, this is a typical kind of earthquake cycle that you might get on the North Anatolian fault. How often might you get earthquake cycles like that according to this strain buildup rate? And so you just actually have to just divide this number by this number and you get that earthquake cycle should happen about once every, a little bit north of once a century. Um, now, the, 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 the caveat with that is we have earthquake history at least in the past 500 years and going back further a little bit um, along the North Anatolian faults. And the, north, and the last earthquake sequence happened probably in the 1600s to 1700s. Um, so that's about 250 to 300 years before. So that 130 year spacing is, is not really tenable with what we know about the fault history. So what might be missing? One of the things is that this earthquake sequence is incomplete. Um, so we haven't had a big earthquake in the Marmara region off Istanbul. That's a continuing very high hazard. So let's say that we're missing an extra third so we've released three quarters of an earthquake cycle, uh, a typical earthquake cycle so far. Maybe if you get to the end of this, it's going to be, it'll be, you know, a full thing. There's also post seismic deformation, um, which is how stuff gets relaxed. And um, after the earthquake, after an earthquake comes along and torques the crust. So let's say that's also an extra 33% on top of this, this uh, total moment release rate in a typical earthquake cycle. Then the other thing, so this number is going to go up by 33% and then again by 33%. The other thing is we're also, there's some signal in this red blob that's non-tectonic, although most of it's probably tectonic. Um, and there's also some that doesn't correspond to strain accumulation. So there are a couple sections, one in Izmit, one in uh, Izmit Pasa, which is over here, that are creeping. So they're not accumulating strain, they're just it's just slipping freely. Um, and so we are aliasing that signal as strain accumulation because this, this is just an estimation method that just does spatial smoothing and, and throws everything together. So let's say we're overestimating the, the, the total strain buildup and the total moment buildup rate by 20%. If you do that, then this 1.7 number goes down to 1.4. This 1.95 number, because of these extra contributions, goes up to about 3.3 3 and a half. And you get that earthquake cycle should happen once every 250 years, which is pretty much exactly what we see in the seismic record. So that's a that's sort of a nice correlation of what we see from the strain and from the um, the earthquakes. And I don't want to oversell that because you know this might not be a typical earthquake cycle, but um, I mean it may it might not be that atypical. And so we can at least use it to get an idea of. Um, what else we might expect. One of the things that is that that implies is that, you know, we don't really do a realistic job unless we account for this earthquake cycle being incomplete um, and also having some post seismic deformation. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe you use that to say, okay, well then we, then we believe more that this earthquake cycle is not yet complete, um, which would affect, you know, your earthquake hazard. So I'll leave that part there and go to an exploration of a time dependent impact on earthquake hazard um, as um, 
present in crustal deformation. Uh, so we'll go to Southeast Alaska now. Um, and so the, the question we wanna look at is how might this kind of strain accumulation on a typical fault, this, in this case, this fault is gonna be in Alaska instead of in Turkey, but how might um, post-glacial rebound, which is, I'll, I'll explain what that is in a second, um, modulate that fault stress and maybe modulate earthquake occurrence. So we're moving to Southeast Alaska now. This is just a blow up of Alaska. Um, what's happening here is that the, uh, the Pacific plate is subducting rapidly beneath Alaska and North America up here, and it's being pulled towards that um, in the Southeast part along a big strike slip fault called the Queen Charlotte Fairweather Fault, um, which I'll get into more in a second. So we're, we're in a, this, we're specifically going to be looking around a place called Glacier Bay, which I don't know if any of you have gotten the chance to go there. I haven't myself, um, even though I was in Alaska, but I was in a different part. Um, and so it's a beautiful, uh, icy wilderness popular with, uh, ferries and cruise ships and visitors. And I think it's a pretty old national park actually. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. This is a picture. This is a picture from the International Space Station. Um, it is, uh, you know, you'd say it's beautiful, but if you look at this and kind of ask where are all the glaciers, um, you kind of have the right idea. And the reason is um, that actually since 1770 AD or so, this region has lost over 3,000 cubic kilometers of ice. And I know everything in Alaska is huge, but um, that's still a massive number. It can probably be more easily thought of in terms of the change in ice thickness. So this is a map of how thick the ice was around 1770. This is a mile in red, um, 1.5 kilometers. So you've lost a 1.5 kilometers of ice thickness in uh, in this Northwest arm and close to you know, a kilometer of ice thickness throughout um, the rest of the bay. This, these diamonds show where the terminus of the ice used to lie. So it used to come all the way out to out of here. Um, and this used to be all covered in almost a kilometer or more of ice. Um, and it's just completely gone now. Um, and there's actually a Native American tribe, the Tlingit, uh, not the, not the, well, I think it's a sub-tribe of the Tlingit that moved into Glacier Bay when the ice like retreated in a hurry. Um, and they formerly lived outside it. So yeah, it's a pretty extraordinary process. Um, so what happens when you remove ice? Um, this, this is a chance to explore like what an extreme time dependent process might do to modulating fault stress and earthquakes. Um, and I'll um, get into more of that in a sec. So what does rapid ice loss do to the earth? You had this big ice sheet that used to be sitting on top of Glacier Bay, you know, just picture a mile of ice here or about that. Um, and it, it flexes the earth downward, the weight of it presses the earth downward. Um, and the mantle, which is viscous over long time scales, flows away to accommodate that. Sort of like when you, if you're like taking a bath and you press like a bath toy down into the bath um, and then the water retreats away around it, just like so with buoyancy, that's kind of what happens. Um, and the ice sheet is the force of your hand pressing the, uh, the, the toy downward. And um, this is basically the same principle as buoyancy. It's just, it's called isostasy. It happens over much longer time scales. It's also like if you have, um, and so, yeah. And then if you, if you remove the ice rapidly as has happened here, all of this is gonna be undone. And all of a sudden you're gonna have, the mantle is gonna, there's going to be a massive difference in the total isostatic thickness here. Um, and so there's going to be no reason for this to be flexured. And so there's going to be a force imbalance. So the mantle is going to rush back in from below. Sort of like if you take your hand off the bath toy, then the water comes up and throws everything up out of the water almost. Um, and this is called post-glacial rebound or glacial isostatic adjustment more recently. Um, and this is also the same. If any of you have like a Tempur-Pedic mattress or one of those memory foam ones, you ever put your, your hand down on it and then you leave it and over like five or 10 seconds, your handprint gets erased and it comes back to the surface. That's exactly the same thing here. Um, the only difference is there's a layer here on top. Whereas I think your entire Tempur-Pedic mattress is like this, uh, beige mantle, but it's basically the same idea. So 
we've lost a kilometer of ice. This is just a, mo a model of it. So what does that do to the uplift? The, what, what does that do to the, the, the crust? That's what we want to explore. So our constraint on what it does to the crust is that the crust is currently uplifting um, in the, the, the area of this former ice pack uh, at four centimeters per year or close to four centimeters per year. Um, so about an inch and a half a year. So that's um, about, it, it has uplifted about 20 feet in the past 200 years. So, I mean, so four centimeters per year is about, I think it's a, about half of like what people grow at in adolescence, but an entire massive Alaskan national park landscape is rising out of the water at that half rate. So this is a big process um, caused by a massive change in ice load um, and then this viscoelastic reflexure. So these are GPS, same as the vectors in the previous plot and those colored circles showing vertical motions. These are vertical motions at GPS sites um, that are just sitting out there, tripods and stuff, sitting out there in Southeast Alaska. Um, and so you get up to four centimeters per year uplift. There's also a big ice loss happening over here. So you get up to three centimeters per year. Um, and running right alongside where this is happening is the Fairweather Queen Charlotte Fault here, which is um, the effective boundary between the Pacific and North American plate uh, and plates. It's sort of a San Andreas fault on steroids. It's similar um, slip sense or the same slip sense as the San Andreas right lateral, the right side. If you're standing and looking across the fault, the right side goes to the right over geologic time and in a single earthquake but it's slipping about 50% again as fast. So about 50 millimeters per year. Um, so two inches a year. Um, and it's not slipping at that rate, it's accommodating strain. And then that's being released in earthquakes and that sums up to that rate over um, geologic and geodetic time scales. And so those earthquakes that accommodate that strain um, or that, that release that strain accumulated um, happen quite often and they can be quite large. Um, the Fairweather Fault is probably most known for a, a 7.8 earthquake in 1958. Um, the, the, it's about the same size as the devastating 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. Um, and the reason that earthquake, I don't, some of you guys might have heard of this. Um, this seven, this 7.8 earthquake in 1958, if any of you ever watched like Discovery Channel or, or stuff on mega tsunamis, um, like I did growing up because I was a huge nerd, this earthquake triggered a massive rock slide into a coastal bay called Latuya Bay, which is right here where all these stations are. Um, and rock slide came down, caused a big splash, which um, caused a wave that, uh, uh, carved out trees and flattened them and um, on a hillside on this spur of this mountain, 1700 uh, feet above sea level. So the run up, this is the highest, I think, known run up in any tsunami wave or any wave ever. Um, if, if you were standing 1700 feet above sea level, you would have been washed out to sea by this tsunami um, or hit by a tree that was getting washed out to sea. Uh, this is a photo um, with some additions of um, some modeling that was done. But these are not, th this photo is basically, I think with a little bit of doctoring with this fading effect, this is basically what this, this spur looked like a few days after the earthquake. So there are a lot of trees here because it's Alaska and it's very verdant. There are no trees here, or at least they're all wrecked. So it's completely washed clean. And I think this tsunami, so this tsunami then propagated out into this bay and out, out to sea. It washed a few fishing boats out to sea and I think four people were killed. There, was a, there were two boats that were wrecked. Um, a third was miraculously carried over the top of like trees because the wave was so high that it just washed it over like the spit and everything and it didn't hit a tree or any debris. So it stayed upright. And their anchor chain ran out at something like a, a couple hundred feet, and they they were actually okay. Um, the, the Howard and Sonny Ulrich was uh, they were the folks on that boat, um, so they, they were okay. Um, and uh, I think they were washed over a, a hundred feet or so over the top of the uh, the trees. 
So that's how high that wave was even out here. So it was a massive amount of water, big splash and big wave. So in order to understand, to go back to uh, the, another spectacular process, we wanna understand what all this ice loss has done to faults like the Fairweather and maybe whether it had an impact on earthquakes like that 1958 earthquake. Um, because it's, it's almost a world record amount of ice loss. Um, so what we do is create a model for this ice loss, or this is the work done by Yen, uh, Yen Hu and some people that were um, working in Jeff Freimuller's lab before I was there. So they, uh, Yen and Chris Larson and other people constructed this model of the history of ice loss. And then you can add some regional history and I won't go into the details of that, but um, this is the decline in ice rates since 1770, this is the decline in Glacier Bay, and then this is the regional decline. Um, and uh, that's the rate at which things happen. So Glacier Bay started melting in a hurry in 1770, and then the rest of the region started going in a hurry in 1900. And that gives you specifically this ice history. So this is, a, this is our model. Um, we have a few different uh, sources of ice loss that we're going to plug into a crustal deformation model and then a stress model. Um, and so in 18, between 1790 and 1860, Glacier Bay is where it's all going down. Um, the, literally, I guess the ice is melting at 10, millimeter, 10 meters per year. Actually, it's way off the, the scale here. Um, and then in 1900 or circa 1900, the rest of Southeast Alaska starts going um, and it picks up. It, it has continued to increase uh, the rate of melting has in the past few decades. Um, and that's incorporated into the model. And there are some tricks because, you know, you have to, we're using data, um, I won't go all the way back, but we're using those GPS uplift velocities, those green and blue ones, which are taken right now. So there is some tricks about, okay, you have to try to resolve the whole, you know, ice history and the viscosity of the lithosphere and um, as fit to velocities that are at present day. So there's trade-offs about, Okay, could there have been more ice loss and a higher viscosity and a thicker lithosphere and stuff like that? But, and I won't go into the details of that, but they did a sort of a big grid search over the parameters controlling the viscosity and viscosity structure of the lithosphere, asthenosphere, figure out how far below um, the surface does does your crust or your lithosphere become like that Tempur-Pedic mattress um, or the, the, the water in the bathtub. Um, and so they have a, I think they have a lid of about 55 kilometers effectively. And so that model fits the present day uplift velocities uh, pretty well. So the, the big circles here are now the model predictions. The small circles are the data. So you can see it fits the, the data pretty well throughout the region. Uh, not perfectly, but about as well as any simple model with just a 1D var variations can do. Um, and then again, these big uplift rates are right alongside where this 1958 earthquake happened. So now we want to understand um, how this, this post-glacial rebound, we know how it's deforming the surface, but how does it uh, inf impact fault stress? So we can actually use the same model in which we calculate all this to figure out the history of how it's impacted the stress on the fair weather and other faults. So just an aside, um, for those of you, uh, if anyone's not familiar with how we think of stress on faults, we think of the, a big quantity that people use is called Coulomb stress, which is essentially how close a fault is to failure. So it's the, uh, the, it's the shear stress on the fault. So how much the two sides want to slip um, or be, are being strained in this preferred slip direction of the fault um, minus the resistance to that shearing, which is, the um, innate resistance of getting hung up on little contacts and rocks and the fact that um, you know rocks have friction and are hard to break and, and move past one another. So Coulomb stress needs to be negative. Um, if the resistance to that shearing equals the shear stress or overcomes it, the fault rocks will fail. So um, specifically the resistance in this, in this um, way of thinking, the resistance to Shearing is the compression uh, force across the two sides, which keeps them hung up on one another, times the coefficient of static friction, which is a property of the rocks and how much they care about being compressed uh, and how much that translates into friction and, and reluctance to slip. Again, that needs to be 
zero. So you can think of in, uh, in, in a seismic hazard perspective, you can think of increasing Coulomb stress bad. Um, and we can look at the, that the Coulomb stress, the absolute Coulomb stress is very hard to come by because we don't really know the absolute stress state of the earth, but we can think about the Coulomb stress change. So um, has a process moved an earthquake or a, a fault closer to or farther from failure? Um, and don't worry about the sign change here, but basically if a, if a process either creates more shear stress on a fault, so if a fault is already trying to slip this way, and a process drives it even more to try to do that, um, then uh, then it's closer to then that process is moving it closer to cool and failure. Or if the process unclamps the fault, which is to deform the crust in a way that moves the two sides apart from one another um, or causes net dilatation across the fault, then that makes it easier for contacts to become unhung and suddenly slip past one another in an earthquake. And again, that's modulated by the friction coefficient, which is um, a fault parameter. And so again, increasing Coulomb stress bad makes it more likely to fail. So we can, um, we can look at, yeah, we assume 0.4 for the friction coefficient here. So we can look at the history of Coulomb stress increase um, from this massive ice loss uh, on the Fairweather Queen Charlotte fault here. Um, and the colors are gonna show that as it changes over time. So this is as of 1840, after we've started to get a big amount of ice loss in Glacier Bay. This is in um, 1900 or by 1900, so the first 130 years. And then this is by 1958. Um, some of this is from the actual unloading, just from uh, taking your hand off the bath toy. And then some of that is from the gradual viscous motion back upwards of the mantle, which also deforms the crust and exacerbates these stress changes. So our main result, what you can see here is that actually the highest stress change, the highest positive stress uh, change on this fault, the Fairweather fault, which you don't even need to really look at this fault. It's almost inactive. The Fairweather is the big um, mover in this region. Um, and the highest stress state on the highest Coulomb stress increase on this fault was actually located very close to the epicenter of this big mega tsunami earthquake in 1958. Um, the Coulomb stress change at the epicenter was something like half a megapascal, depending on how you model it, but that's a pretty, it's something on that order of magnitude. Um, there have been studies that show that Coulomb stress changes that are 1 50th this size can modulate seismicity. Um, it's going too far to say ice loss triggered this earthquake because this, this fault is a remember this fault is, is accommodating tectonic strain at one and a half times the rate of the San Andreas. So it's also getting loaded really fast all the time by just plates. But, um, you know, the, the, the correlation between where the stress change was the highest and where this earthquake popped off is, is nevertheless pretty remarkable. Um, so it may have played a, at least a, a role on top of the long-term plate uh, load, uh, motion. And actually, if you, if you, if you, instead of just looking at the fair weather fault and calculating these Coulomb stress changes over time, if you look at all faults in Southeast Alaska, um, you can create a map of, so this is a map of the Coulomb stress change on whatever the fault orientation is at any given location. And we infer what that fault orientation is both from the orientations of the fair weather and faults like these and thrust faults up here, and also from some, a few earthquake focal mechanisms. Um, so, you know, over here, it would be based on this earthquake. Um, over here, it would be based on the fact that we have the fair weather fault in the model. Over here, it's based on, we have a bunch of thrust faults in the model. So actually you can see them here. These are a bunch of thrust planes. So we interpolate from that. And sorry, um, what you can see here is that actually the majority of earthquakes that have happened over the past 120 years have been Coulomb stress increased by this history of ice loss. Um, and I don't want to oversell that. Again, this region is deforming really fast tectonically as well as post-glacially, but um, the, the ice loss certainly is, has helped these earth. I mean, it's certain, it hasn't, it hasn't made things any harder for these earthquakes to happen. And it may, the fact that, you know, you haven't had earthquakes over here um, or, you know, here, for example, 
um, or out here possibly is, a you know, it's maybe it's a little bit related to the fact that the ice is the ice loss and the viscoelastic uplift has been driving those regions farther from failure. So that would, you know, out here would not be the first region to go. Um, out here would not be the first region to go on the fair weather. It would be down here like it did in this 1958 earthquake. So that's, um, that's kind of our main takeaway from this kind of thing. And so um, those are the kinds of things that uh, I'm interested in and I love studying um, and that I'm going to try to apply to studying in New Zealand and then throughout the rest of the world. Um, sort of a combination of how is stuff going gradually and moving um, and being strained and what does that relate to, what does that mean for the likelihoods of earthquakes over time? Um, and then how is that gradual tectonic motion modulated by, um, by more uh, sudden and less and short-term processes um, with the example of Alaska where we can um, look at a big sudden short-term process next to a big fault and it's a cool test case for that. So um, that is actually where I'd like to uh, stop. I um, want to thank you all again for your uh, for watching and happy to take any questions and hear any suggestions you guys have. I know there's a few comments in the chat already. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so um, I would go through the audience list. Is there any questions? Bob Stern has asked, the North Anatolian fault is the only strike slip I know, yeah, it's the only strike slip fault I know of, uh, also true, it's the only one I know of that shows the east and west progression in seismicity, why? Um, that is a great question. I, uh, it might be in, well, okay, there are a few, there are a few things I can think of, sorry, I'll just get out of this. Um, one possibility is that this is how it usually goes on the North Anatolian Fault, and so it's sort of a self-perpetuating process where if you come to the beginning of an earthquake cycle, it'll be the longest, uh, it'll be the longest time since an earthquake on the Eastern end. Like it'll be 300 years since you had a earthquake on the Eastern end and only 200 since you had one on the Western end. And so this will be more likely to go first. That is only, that only works if it kind of, uh, speeds up into that, um, uh, alignment of always going west to east uh, or east to west. The other factor, another factor is that the, the East Anatolian Fault also had a, a sequence of earthquakes in the late 19th century, um, 1880s and 1900s, and this one in 1905, and those could also have loaded the, uh, the corner and launched this thing off. Um, it's certainly an interesting uh, migration of earthquakes. So let's see. All right, so I think we have a question uh, from Tom. Okay. I'm going to get all this working here. Um, on your last uh, Alaska slide, well, the, the main question is if there's some uplift uh, drivers for these faults, why don't the fault plane solutions seem to show a little more oblique slip? They all seem to be transcurrent on, on your last Alaska slide, or the majority of them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Huh. I, interesting. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess you can always blame the tectonics because the tectonics are very fast transcurrent, but you're right that you would expect to see um, some component. Um, it actually, I have a slide, I, I have a figure showing this. Um, 
I just haven't put it in here, but we calculated the stress change for dip slip on the Fairweather Fault from this ice loss. And it actually goes, so the, the Fairweather Fault likes to be east side up a little bit. I think it is a ratio of like 10 to one of right lateral to east side up dip slip um, geologically. And actually this ice loss, I believe it would have, um, no, sorry, I think it's west side up. And I think this ice loss would have actually um, decreased the Coulomb stress for dip slip. So I don't know if it helped that aspect and I'm not sure how generalizable that would be. Um, yeah, I didn't, I, I can grab that, that figure um, for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I, I think that would be a great test case, especially with smaller earthquakes like we have in the Alaska Seismic Network um, catalog of are, are, they, are they more or less transcurrent here than one might expect in a typical dextral region. Or sorry, more or less oblique, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see, is there any other questions? There's one in the chat. David Frazier has asked, what time frame for ice is considered a rap lift, a rapid uplift for where the crust is concerned? Yeah, um, I would say probably 100 years um, or something like that. This has been, because uh, I think the, the, well, it depends on what mantle model you use. Um, typical viscosity estimates in the context of post-glacial rebound, they can be up to 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22, 10 to the 23. And I think they get, some of them get as low as 10 to the 19, like this one. So this would be about as rapid as it gets. Um, and I mean, I think actually the viscosity is probably a power law that the viscosity itself increases with time. Um, so this would be on the rapid end of that. And uh, after a lot of stuff has just happened, it, it, it relaxes or it, it uh, moves back very quickly. And then that slowly, slowly, slowly um, decreases over time. So I think probably a hundred years, maybe a few decades. There's also a really rapid one happening in Patagonia that also gets up to four centimeters a year of uplift. I think it's like a very close call between whether this or that is the highest, the fastest um, on earth. So, yeah. All right, cool. So in the meantime, I have a question, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very general question. I'm interested to know um, since you work in different you know um, environments, different latitudes. Do you think that climate, um, like if we have a cold and dry climate or warm and humid, these different kind of climates, do you think can affect on the behavior of the fouls and um, the number of the seismicity in the area? It's possible. Um, I think there's a lot of research showing this on like affecting like melting glaciers affecting volcanoes. And I think there's some evidence that they can maybe modulate seismicity rates um, in really extreme cases like the Himalayas and things like that. I, I'm actually, I, sh I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that because I need to read more about that. Um, so the complication with this Alaska case, and I don't want to I, I'm not sure, um, is that the ice loss started in 1770. Um, and so uh, that was just pre-industrial revolution. And it might actually be a really unstable response to the end of the Little Ice Age, um, which started in, I think, about 1350 and lasted until about 1750. Um, this regional ice loss could... I mean, I, 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 could, I could believe that that was in part the result of um, increases in emissions during the, since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it actually turns out that most of this motion in this case and this stress change is actually from this, this one that happened before, at least so far, but I think it'll be taken over by uh, regional ice loss in the future. Um, in one sense, this is about as extreme as you can get because it's a huge ice loss next to a huge fault with big earthquakes that you can use as test cases. Um, and so 
uh, it might be a lot more subtle in other areas. Like another region that I was thinking of exploring this would, is um, that I plan to explore this is the Southern Alps in New Zealand, because we have a similar situation with the Alpine faults, which is actually very similar to the Fairweather fault. And there's mountains that are, you know, the glaciers are retreating and retreating, but there's just not as much ice in the Southern Alps. So I expect the signal will be dramatically smaller than this. Um, I think it can modulate uh, we, we've, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that the retreat of glaciers after the end of the last ice age caused earthquakes in unexpected places, um, like Scandinavia and Scotland. Um, so big changes in ice pack can for sure influence, um, stress on falls and cause earthquakes like that. Um, the one sort of caveat and so there, there could be cases, more extreme cases like this, where that happens, you know, in the present or in the future um, with, uh, with climate change. The one caveat is that a lot of earthquakes are underwater, so it's not going to modulate the stress on those nearly as much. Um, just, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to affect subduction zone earthquakes, except on the Himalayan subduction zone, maybe. But right. um, so, yeah, but in coastal countries, that would be where the hazard comes from. So, All right, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat room uh, from Jordan. Sure. Okay. Um, is there a movement velocity where viscoelastic rebound changes to a more brittle behavior? That is an interesting question. Um, I would think... Probably, I, uh, I, I'm not sure. It it depends if it depends if like higher viscosity qualifies as more brittle, um, and so if you have a power law viscosity in which as the motion slows down, the viscosity goes up. That would be a case of that. Um, so that would become more brittle. Um, I think it possibly can be also a function of crustal thickness. Um, where the action is happening should, in principle, spread out over time. It'll, it should be really heavy under where the, um, where the ice has been lost. So these arrows should should be really heavy up right here at the beginning. And then, and then it should kind of propagate outward with time. So um, it's sort of a function of crustal thickness in that way, I think. Um, and then the crustal thickness also, I don't know if it can, well, it should, yeah, it should control the temperature, which would affect the ability to change viscosity and it would affect the viscosity uh, at, any, um, at any time scale. So the thicker the crust, you know, that, that, that modulates the temperature. Um, and it also impacts our ability to resolve all this because if the mantle, like if you're in a craton somewhere and the mantle is 400 kilometers, or the effective viscoelastic mantle is like hundreds of kilometers below the surface, you, it's, it's kind of hard to see anything. Um, or I mean, to, it's, it, you can still see stuff like the last glacial, um, uh, post glacial rebound from the last ice age, but it's harder to resolve specific parameters of it and, and like test different models. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Sure. Yeah. 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 So although, although Turkey is well instrumented compared to a lot of regions in the world, um, you, you know, the station spacing is 
on the order of tens of kilometers. Um, so uh, that's uh, Insar can get you to a you know a resolution of a kilometer um, at least at like with clarity. So that helps there because your fault only goes down 15 kilometers. So if your stations are too far away, like 50 kilometers away, you can see a lot more by having a one kilometer resolution map of right over the fault. I don't think this would be quite as uh, different in Southern California or in California because there's so, or in Taiwan, because like, or in Japan, because there are so many GPS stations there that they probably already resolve the processes about as well as you can, given that there's still a crustal lid that obscures everything anyway. So yeah, this might be a case where it's about as different as it gets. Well, there was just an earthquake here. Um, uh, yes. Uh, well, no. Well, in in this case, sorry, there was an earthquake here. That's interesting. Um, the uh, in this case, the GNSS, the fact that it has three D velocities, um, so you have both the horizontals and the verticals, that helps tie and figure out the absolute motions. So the INSAR is only in one line of sight. Um, at a time. Now, there are some tricks uh, that are just being developed to figure out actually the full 3D um, velocity field from INSAR by itself. Um, in theory, traditionally, you have ascending data and descending data. And so you only have you know, two, equ two, uh, two equations. So you can only do two unknowns. So you sort of resolve only two dimensions. So you have to like maybe assume that the vertical is zero or something else or assume that the north south is zero. Um, or you can use the GNSS and then tie everything together because the GNSS can see all three dimensions. But there are those INSAR tricks that like Andy Hooper and people at Leeds are working on where you can get actually both the direct, both the, uh, the INSAR motion in this direction and in this direction. And that gives you four constraints because you have two different look directions and that's more than enough that you need. Um, the constraints in the along track direction as opposed to the line of sight direction, those are sort of more subtle. It's, I think it's messier, but if you have something really clear like the Dead Sea Fault where you're flying along a massive north-south fault, those can help. Um, so yeah, I think you can probably in principle do it based on INSAR alone. I don't know if it'll be better than GNSS um, because you might still get these sort of violent variations that GNSS still helps you figure out, okay, is that real or is that something else other than tectonic motion? Um, I think you can get probably as good, long answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, I definitely want to, don't want to pretend like I I'm like a I'm a, a master at it at all. Um, there's definitely a um, there, there's sort of an art of like conveying the essentials without losing not the attention of non specialists. So, like in a science paper. Um, I mean, well, this is also also kind of true in science, but it's to a different extent. Like in a science paper, you want to you know be transparent about everything you did and 
a reviewer might ask, well, what, didn't you think about this? And then you have to include a sentence or a paragraph about that or a figure about that, or, you know, at least in supplementary materials, the public is like, they don't know that, you know, problem X could be a problem as much because they're not a specialist. So they're, uh, it actually is kind of counterproductive to tell them about that because then it just sort of distracts them at best. So it's sort of like, here's what we found, um, you know, maybe a couple numbers, but you have to give some sort of context for what they mean. Like, so like four centimeters per year is the scale your fingernails grow, that kind of thing, but, or, or, you know, um, a bar, I think a, th a third of a bar is about the pressure in your car tires. I, I think it might be the other way around. Those kind of things help. Um, and, uh, And so it's sort of a, yeah, it's, 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 it, 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 it needs to be a little bit sort of just, um, uh, more discovery channel ish, I guess. Um, and there's a, there's a delicate balance and I know it every time I try to do this of like, you know that there's future work to be done and that, you know, your conclusions are dependent on this assumption and this assumption and this assumption. So it's a little, sometimes a little bit uncomfortable to like go and say, and this is what we discovered. Um, and so it's sort of like, it's, it's, I'm still working on this myself, but it's kind of like trying to strike a balance between like, uh, getting lost in the uncertainties and the weeds, but also being like honest about, you know, we haven't resolved everything. Here's something that we think we've figured out, um, which is not that dependent on other things. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that I, cause I've written, I've written probably like a few articles for Tumblr, uh, that, 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 that uh, blog, um, and that, that service. And it's something I've definitely, it, it just takes practice. Um, I was very lucky to work with Ross Stein actually as an intern, um, during high school and college. Um, so I was introduced to the way he conveys information to the public very early on. And it actually even then took me a while to kind of come around to it because I, I liked to be very kind of, well, thorough is probably too polite a word. I like to be very plentiful with how I explain things because it was like, especially in grad school, you don't want, you want people to like think that, you know, you did everything. Like you, you, you thought of everything like, you know, whatever, uh, you, uh, you've completed the project. Um, and you don't need to go to that length with the public. So. Um, and I, I'll, there's also a quote I like from Sebastian Younger, who's the, uh, the author that wrote the book called The Perfect Storm, which was turned into that movie. Um, he was very nervous about the publication of his first book, which actually was The Perfect Storm. And, you know, he was like fretting about it, losing sleep. And he, what he said he would tell himself now, if he could tell, if he could talk to himself back then was like, the public is not a threat I'm quoting from him. The public is looking for something that's helpful and makes sense. So, I mean, I don't know if that's universally true in this age of misinformation, but I think that's general. I, I try to be optimistic about it. So thank you. All right. Great. So is there any other questions? Let's look in the chat. Yeah. I guess I don't think so. All right, great. So once again, thank you, Chris. Uh, we are happy, you know, having you and sharing your, your work with us. That, that was great. Thanks again. And thank sure. you for audience uh, for joining. I think we had really a uh, great uh, number of attendants. That's great that we have that much people interested to, um, to your work. And uh, I hope to see you all again in the next coming weeks uh, in our seminar. And what's your work, work. Chris? Yes, thanks thank again for accepting uh, for being with us uh, in the morning. So yeah, all well, good. Down. Thank you so much for the invite, and um, and it's great to meet all meet all of you. I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. All right. Uh, I think we are done, everybody. So if you guys uh, have no questions, so we can say goodbye to Chris and. Catch you, Chris. Hey, Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Mortaza.
Thank, Thank you. you Bye. Thank you.